So I, uh, I'm in love with this man. Nerds Podcast episode number 239. John Chris Valusi, creator of Ren and Stippy. Now entering Nerdist.com. Headphones on so you can hear yourself, hear us better. That, that those those tend to that help. I would. I should do that. Yeah, let's see. How if you want to be like us? <laughs> if you want to, if you want to be big shot, if you want to be cool, you want to look like these guys. <laughs> fucking big shot. If big fucking big shot. Hollywood big shot. What is the number one question that they ask you the most on Reddit? How did you come up with the idea? Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> what for? Where do you get your ideas from? Where do you get your? Well, ideas that's, from? that's that's a good question. Did that you I can answer? But did you have a dog when you were? Yeah. <laughs> I do, I love I, I I love the shit out of Reddit and but but those threads, especially when someone like you goes on and you get like ten thousand comments. Just people don't don't have time. they just don't bother to read all of the other thousands of comments, and so you get. Well, I could see why I mean, why they wouldn't. Yeah, because there's so many of them. You know, it's just a giant list. It's it, it it can't automatically categorize itself into the questions. Yeah. So yeah, it would be hard to follow it. So, how did you come up with? No, I'm kidding. Uh, I I have a I have a long history with that show. I was in college. I bet his history is longer. His history is a little bit longer than yeah. mine. I was in college. Stumbled across it one afternoon at 11 a.m. on Nickelodeon. It was, I guess they were packaging it with Doug and Rugrats, I think. It was the Nicktoons. That was the premiere of It was the Nicktoons, yeah. I just happened to catch it once. It was Space Madness. And a minute in, I was like, what is it? Because I was a huge animation nerd when I was growing up. Like, huge Clampett, Chuck Jones fan. And it was everything that I hadn't seen in so long that I instantly started recording the episodes. And then we would have viewing parties and, you know, and then the show and then the show ended up becoming... That sounds like I'm saying I took responsibility for that. I'm not. I'm just saying... You did it. <laughs> these viewing parties I at UCLA. So John, are, uh, we yeah. did it, buddy. Yeah. We did it. That's you? Yeah, well... That was you? And I actually studied... I took a couple quarters of animation at UCLA. And uh, I called Spumco one day. And I admittedly... Um, posed as a newspaper reporter for the UCLA Bruin just so I could interview you. And you did talk to me. I did? Yeah. Wait, where was this? UCLA. I, I was at UCLA? No, no. I just called in and scheduled an appointment with your assistant. And, oh. And I think I loosely thought I was going to pitch the story to the UCLA Bruin. <laughs> I never did that. It turns out we just had a conversation that never became a story. So oh, no. sorry I lied to you all that time ago. Maybe you can print it now. Oh shit! <laughs> I better remember everything. Only I twenty years after. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I sort of became a Spumco groupie and hung around, and I've been friends with Vince Waller since those days. And oh wow! And uh, and and learn. I thought I was a decent artist at the time, and tried time and time again to get a job on that show, and then realized that I was a shitty artist, and really learned what real art was because of you. It was studying like you, and I think you had advised. Harvey Kurtzman and 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 guys like that, just very simple construction. So, were the was that sort of your main inspiration, art wise? Uh, no, I've got a million inspirations. Uh, Harvey Kurtzman is one of them. Yeah, but uh, no, that there was a summer between uh, season one and season two. Yeah, where I wanted to um, keep some of the artists on and have them uh, learn new things so that we could apply them to the second season. And so I asked Nickelodeon, is that okay? Can you can you pay for people's salaries over the summer so I don't have to lay them off and, and they don't have to go get other jobs and then we have to start with new artists the second yeah. season. I said, I want to spend the summer getting better. So we studied um, a bunch of artists. And Harvey Kurtzman was was one of them. And I, not everybody knew who Harvey Kurtzman was at the time. Vincent knew. Yeah. Um, Bob Camp knew. Jim Smith knew. The main, the main guys knew. But some of the younger guys didn't know who he was. So I, they had just uh, reprinted, hey, look, uh, Dennis Kitchen. Yeah. So I brought that around. Oh, I, I think I Xeroxed a whole bunch of the pages. And I had people draw Kurtzman's poses from, hey, look, only draw Ren and Stimpy in those poses. Oh, wow. Because 
the way Kurtzman drew it was so dynamic with uh, as few lines as possible, but he could get more out of a pose and an expression than like you could see in a hundred Disney films. Yeah. And it's just, the guy's a genius. Right. And I said, look, this economy of, of, uh, of statement is just, it's perfect for animation. I'm, I'm amazed Harvey Kurtzman didn't become an animator because he would have been a great one. I don't know that much about his life. Actually. Was he, uh, what was what was his time period? I mean, I know I always think of him as just being old time. Well, he created Mad. That's what he's famous for. He created Mad Comics and Mad Magazine, and you know he was the the main uh, editor of uh, EC Comics. Oh right, okay, got it. And, you know who got into all kinds of trouble with uh, Wortham for morals, you know, yeah, morally corrupting the kids <laughs> of, uh, of and American tales. stuff. Yeah, so they they had to come up with the comics code and everything and that killed EC Comics basically. And so they just switched over to Harvey came up with the idea, I think, for Mad Magazine. So they dropped a lot of their comics and, and uh, including the Mad comic and switched over to magazine format. They didn't have so many rules. Right. And, you know, that's what that that's what he's really famous for. And the comics. I mean, he he's a guy like um, not only is he super talented, but he was a talent scout and he could develop other people's talents. I mean, he's the guy that. You know, pushed Jack Davis and Wally Wood, yeah. and Craigstein and and you know, Frazetta and I mean, he had a killer team. He had this team of some of uh, history's greatest comic artists, and he was pushing them around and getting them to do better stuff than they would even do on their own. And, and a lot of them, a lot of their styles really owe a lot to uh, Kurtzman's dynamic posing. Hmm. Did you ever work with him? No, I met him once uh, when I was going to Sheridan College, late seventies in a cartooning program and he was one of the speakers and he came one day and, and at that time I didn't know that much about him and I hadn't seen Hey Look you know like I knew Mad Comics sure. Mad Magazine because I collected them when I was a kid yeah me too but his drawings weren't in them his compositions were but at that time I didn't really know what a composition was <laughs> I knew who Wally Wood was and Jack Davis and, and all the other artists uh, and I just knew that he was the editor but I didn't know that meant he could draw really well and it was a few years later um, a friend of mine, Kent Butterworth, who had a good comic book collection and stuff, he had all these rare, like self-published types of things, and he had a, a little one on Harvey Kurtzman. It was, it was about half the size of a comic book, and it had really crummy reproductions of all kinds of stuff he did. His early, like, realistic comics and stuff he did in the forties. Yeah, oh, wow. uh, some of ZC stuff. I mean, he did those great Mad Comics covers. Right. Uh, just absolutely beautiful. And then it had all these like little tiny reprints of Hey Look. And I was looking at those going, holy crap, holy crap, this is genius. I, don't, I didn't know about this stuff. I wish I knew when I met him, right? So then I went to Xerox machine and I tried Xeroxing them up. So for years, all I had was these really bad copies of Xeroxed up from a shitty copy that was really small of a few pages of Hey Look. So when Dennis Kitchen put out the, the compilation of Hey Look, I went nuts. I bought like 10 copies of it and gave them to you know all the main artists and stuff. And I drilled it. I was like a drill sergeant that summer. <laughs> and a lot of the artists at first, the younger artists, rebelled against it. This guy can't draw. It's too simple. <laughs> said, you idiot. Young <laughs> people it. Young people want to make everything harder. They think things have to be complicated to, to have meaning, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. I, but it was always... It, and it's, it's deceptively simple because when you look at Harvey Kurtzman or you look at even... You know, because they gave me, I think Vincent or someone had given me sort of the audition packet for for Ren and Stimpy. And you look and you go, well, how hard is that? It's just like a simple line and they're just standing there. And you start trying to do it and you're like, oh, shit. Oh, there's that. This body has no gravity. This hasn't, you know, this isn't the right. Oh, fuck. And then you realize it's really fucking hard. It is hard. It's hard to be easy. It really uh, is. It's years of experience to, to get your stuff to... To be simpler to look at, but to have more soul and more uh, more purpose to it. Yeah, for a friend of mine, uh, a friend of mine has this idea where he says, uh, "Line, speed, beauty." And with anything you do, first you have to learn the line, then you can get good at getting fast at it, and then you can make it beautiful after that. But it's it's that level of expertise that you have to achieve in order to to make the thing simple. Yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of artists. <clears throat> especially in our business, it's kind of an inbred business, right? It doesn't have a, a wide set of influences. There's a, you know, there's a few cartoonists like Vincent yeah. or me or Bob Camp or who love all kinds of cartoon media. And we take all those influences into our own style. 
but a lot of animators, particularly young ones, they just grew up with modern animation, and that's all they know. So they're doing imitations of imitations of imitations. Right. And they don't know what's behind the original Nine Old Men, for example. Like, there's a whole school of animation artists that really come out of the 60s Disney movies. And, uh, but with every few years, it degenerates another... It's like copying a you know a VHS. Right, exactly. Times. A copy of a copy, of a, copy, copy. of a copy, like your Kurtzman booklet. Yeah, you know, except that still kind of had <laughs> the guts of Harvey in it. Um, I don't know. I forget what we were talking about, but yeah, well, you think, should have a lot of influences, definitely. But I, yeah. but the thing that I always appreciated about about Ren and Stimpy in particular, what is is that there was a there was a period of time. I'm telling you what you already know, but you know, obviously when. You know, studios like Hanna Barbera or Lou Scheimer or any of those like '60s and '70s studios came along and figured out how to make animation really cheaply. Um, they the the characters stopped having weight, and they stopped. I felt like Ren and Stimpy was a return to a style of animation where the characters had like three dimensional skeletal structures, and so if you saw a character wipe its hand across its face, you would see the skeleton underneath. Which I always was one of my favorite things about Chuck Jones is that he just had this amazing ability to capture um you form. know like yeah form and 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 subdermal skeletal structures yeah you're talking about that scene of elmer fudd in uh in the barber chair in oh uh, yeah yeah in rabbit of seville yeah rabbit of seville yeah and, yeah that's hilarious that scene and that's why it's funny is he's moving the skin around and the head's just moving so subtly but you feel like there's a skull in there yeah. yeah like that's nothing you could write no script writer could come up with a gag like that only an animator could come up with a gag like that and you have to be a really good animator to pull it off and that was i think that was sort of your model wasn't it the the um the empowering the animators as the writers and the creators rather than as just part of this like <laughs> assembly line of you know well those will be the artists and those will be the writers and then those guys will animate like you you really empowered the animators right to 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 do all of that to carry yeah. out the vision well i just went back to basically how animation started uh with some things some practical realities that we were just stuck with like you had to send the animation to korea because of budgets and stuff. sure so i came up with this sort of stopgap band-aid system where um even if we had to give the animation to to asia where they don't care, right? And they just have to do as many drawings as they can mm -hmm. per day. We would do all the key drawings in house. So we, did, we called that the layout department, which normally the layout department just puts a couple of characters in it and fits them into the background. And then that goes to the animator. But if you, if you use that system and send it to Korea, you're just going to get like crappy drawings traced from the model sheets. Right. No, you're not going to get anybody inventing new poses or anything. Right. So I got a bunch of guys together and said, um, Let's do all the layouts here, but we'll add lots of poses. So we'll tell the story visually instead of just having them flap their mouths right? Yeah. and say, I'm going, you know, in the cartoons in the 80s, everybody would tell you everything that was going on. I feel sad. <laughs> you do? Well, I'm going to make you sadder. Well, first, I'm going to walk over the door. See me walk to the door. <laughs> I am opening the door. <laughs> you know, and like the artists had no say in anything in the 80s. We we're just like scum. We were like the lowest of the lowest. There was a lot students. of bad animation during that time. Yeah, well, it was dead. It was a dead art form. We'd all look at classic cartoons from the 30s and 40s, and we were awestruck, right? Like, how the hell did they do this stuff? How did they do squash and stretch? How did they do overlapping <laughs> action? Like, we knew what the concepts were, but because there was no studio that, that you did that at, yeah. and even if you tried to do it, they wouldn't let you do it. Right. If you did, if you did squash and stretch, they would say none of that Tex Avery crap. Oh, oh shit! Wow. Really? Yeah. It took a while for that to come back. Well, because there were no particularly the first cartoon with even squash and stretch in the eighties was uh, um, uh, Brad Bird's uh, Family Dog. Oh, and oh we yeah! Were all amazed, like wow! Oh, ama amazing story. How did they yeah. do that? Yeah. yeah. Like they were still keeping that alive at Cal Arts, right? But then the people would get out of Cal Arts and they'd have to go work. For if they didn't get a job at Disney's, which was hardly doing animation at that time, they'd end up at the Saturday morning studios where you're not allowed to use it. That's so nobody really, even though we would all admire and love old cartoons, nobody had any idea of how, it, how they did it. It was just looking, looking at magic. It was witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys, they do this stuff. you guys seem to figure out that, you know, that it's interesting to hear the key pose idea because Ren and Simpy, to me, was very much based that, like, there were, there were no wasted frames. It was action pose to action pose and i think i read somewhere that you said sort of like what you were saying before when when a cartoon 
is so heavily dialogue written that you could shut your eyes and still know what's going on, that it's essentially just animated radio, and yeah, it's not... It's, not, it's just that. talking heads. That's what Chuck... Oh, that was Chuck. Chuck called limited animation, illustrated radio, the, the early TV cartoons, because that's... You know, and those early cartoon uh, TV cartoons were a million times better than the <laughs> ones we were working on in the 80s. The early ones were Huckleberry Hound and Yogi Bear and, and the Flintstones. Right. Now, those characters, even though they were limited animation, it was the best animators in the world people who had worked on the classic Disney, MGM, Warner Brothers shorts in, in the 40s, 30s and 40s, they're doing limited animation now. So they really knew what they were doing. When they economized, they still did it with, with, with personality and stuff. And those characters had a lot of personality. Yogi Bear had personality. The characters in the 80s had no personality whatsoever. And by limited, you, I, do you mean like 12 frames per second as opposed to like 24 frames per second? Uh, well, no, full animation can be, 12 frames a second can be t is full animation some scenes you would do on ones 20, 24 right. frames but that's really exaggerated fast moving stuff when you do it on ones right but 12 is is traditionally uh full animation on ones basically one one shot per drawing one new drawing for every frame yeah yeah uh traditional full animation is uh one drawing for two frames right but limited animation is like you have held drawings you have some drawings that aren't moving at all. Like when Yogi Bear walks, well, Fred Flintstone, everybody knows this when they see the Flintstones. Sure. Fred's walking and maybe his body is moving up and down, but it's not actually animating. Right. But the feet are moving. Yeah. And, and the head's bobbing up and so down. So you have a few different layers. The lips are moving. Yeah, sometimes in the old, in the in, in some older animation, if they stack too many layers of cells on top of each other, you can start to see the shading of yeah. other layers. Yeah, they get darker, the cells that are lower down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's hilarious. <laughs> what, what, the, uh, the old Betty Boop cartoons, what, what made those have such like a weird rhythm to them? Like, what was the, uh, the rate? You mean just because it was so like fluid and... Yeah, kind of bouncy. Well, all the, uh, all the old cartoons were timed to music. And the first sound cartoons, starting with uh, St Steamboat Welly, um, they realized if we're going to do this to sound, we want to get good timing. And where do you get good timing? From music. And most animators, most good animators are musicians too, or amateur musicians at least. And they have a good sense of rhythm. Right? So they, they timed, even when they were doing a, a cartoon in the 30s that wasn't to a song, they still timed it as if they were writing a song. They, they wrote the timing on bar sheets. Holy shit. On musical bar sheets. You know, they were divided into beats and bars. And, the, you know, they would decide, is it, is it a four, four beats to the bar? Is it four, four? Is it, is it three, four? Is it, you know? Wow. Uh, and uh, that's why all the old cartoons f have such great timing and they feel so good. And, and the Fleischer cartoons in particular, I mean, they worked with great jazz musicians and yeah. stuff. Cab Calloway and, and Louis Armstrong and, and uh, the Mills Brothers. And they just had their own really weird style, a weird New York style. And uh, the cartoons all were kind of like flapper cartoons. They were yeah. like hot jazz cartoons. And, and the, 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 the visuals and the characters and everything really reflected that kind of edgy, dirty, uh, low down. Heroin cartoons. Yeah. The kind, kind of, of heroin cartoons. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what they kind of were. Yeah. I mean, but none of those guys took drugs or anything. They were all super straight laced Republican types. Oh wow, that's interesting. Yeah. What about Clampett? Was he was he sort of a was Clampett a shit stirrer or was he did it just seem like that with the yeah, kinds he of was a practical joker, that's for sure. And he was kind of crazy. Uh, I knew him. What? Uh, yeah. Uh, when I first came to LA, I, I met Clampett. I looked him up. He was my hero, right? So I looked him up and we became friends right away. And the very first time I met him was at a comic convention. And I can't remember if it was the Comic Con, the big one, or if it was in Anaheim or the, uh, there used to be an L.A. one, right? Well, there have been a handful of L.A. ones. There, there's, like, regional ones. There was, there was, you know, there was one in Pasadena. Like, I think, depending on how you define a Comic-Con. Well, it had to be south of the, of the, of the hills because what happened was uh, I met him at the con. He, he invited me. He says, come on down to the Comic-Con. I had just moved there. Come to the Comic-Con. I have to give out an award to uh, Jack Kirby or somebody, right? It was amazing. <laughs> I'm meeting all these people, like, together, all my heroes. <laughs> And so I'm sitting at the table with Bob, and I think Sodi was there, his wife and his family. I'm in complete awe, right, at this comic convention that I don't remember where it was. And uh, Bob went up and gave a little speech and handed an award to somebody famous, Milton Kniff or somebody. <laughs> you know, Jack Kirby, I can't remember. I was just too dumbstruck. And, and then we had some fancy dinner or something. And after the dinner, 
Bob kind of like leans over and whispers in my ear, Hey, John, uh, you want to go on an adventure with me? Uh, sure. Why not? He says, well, I've been invited to the first annual uh, Burbank Parade. So you can be my guest. <laughs> All right, cool. I don't know what that is, but let's go. So he throws me in his car, right? And then he, and he says, oh, by the way, we're late, so I'm going to have to go pretty fast. So he's going over the Hollywood Hills, like at 70 miles an hour, like over Laurel Canyon or something like that. <laughs> and we're right on the edge of those like dirt roads and stuff. Oh, yeah. Overlooking you know, Hollywood and stuff like that. I thought we were going to die. Because he, he would keep turning around while he was driving and tell me stories. <laughs> <laughs> he tell me wacky stories that happened at Termite Terrace and Looney Tunes and stuff like wow. that. Tell me stories of Chuck Jones and Bob McKimson and Rod Scraven and all these people. And they were great stories. But I was terrified. <laughs> Maybe he worked <laughs> in cartoons for so long, got... he thought you would just go over the rail and then just bounce back. Yeah. Out, yeah. It was insane. But we ended up at the parade, and then that's a whole crazy story in itself. Why? <laughs> what, what was so crazy about a Burbank parade? Well, we got there late, so a bunch of the floats had already left, and they were all coming out of some garage or firehouse or something like that, right? So we get there, and we get out of the car. Oh, and the first thing that Bob did was he opened the trunk. And he pulled out a bottle of Aqua Velva, <laughs> and he shoved it in his collar and started squirting it all over his armpits and chest with it in his shirt, right? And then he looked at me, and he, and he shoved it in my face. You want some? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so again, I splash it all inside my shirt. I'm not going to insult Bob Clampett, you know, if he thinks this is a good thing. <laughs> Your skin's burning off. Yeah. It was, so then we, we race over to the firehouse, and Bob says, oh, you know what, John? My float is way up there, and he points, you know, to like 10 floats away or something like that. So it's too late for us to make it there. We're going to have to borrow somebody else's float or take, a, you know, hitch a ride with somebody else. <laughs> it's like my favorite year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I said, well, that's cool. So one float comes by, and there's all these pretty girls on it. There's a float covered with flowers and these girls in bikinis or something, right? And I said, hey, Bob, <laughs> how about that float? <laughs> He goes, perfect. And he grabs my shirt and he yanks me. And we're running over to the float. He starts climbing up this float with all the pretty girls, right? And he's got his Cecil puppet on his arm. And he shoves oh the God. Cecil puppet in their face. He starts going, howdy! I'm Cecil the sea uh, uh, serpent. And then he goes, I'm coming, beanie boy. I'm coming. Right at the girls, right? And some guy, a security guard or something, comes running up and starts pounding on Bob's back. Get down off that float. So that didn't work out. <laughs> So then we're standing around and Bob's watching all the cars come out and, he, and he's going up to all the windows and knocking on all the windows and people in the cars are rolling down the windows. What? You know, howdy! <laughs> I'm coming! Well, you're not going to come on my window. <laughs> so finally, he gets somebody who will talk to him. A little car comes out and it has, it has a lightweight or featherweight boxer from, I don't know, he's from the 50s or something. So he's old now, right? But I guess he was famous in the 50s. He's there with his, his little wife and stuff. And Bob talks him into letting us sit in the back seat uh, of their float. Well, it's really just their car with a big sign on it saying what the guy's name was and everything. Featherweight champion of 1959 or something, <laughs> right? So Bob, he finds me some float paper or something. He says, quick, John, I want you to, uh, you know, do me a sign. It says Bob Clampett and, you know, draw something on it. It's like, oh, okay, Bob Clampett. And I drew Bugs Bunny and Beanie and Cecil real fast. He somehow, he tapes this over top of the other guy's sign. <laughs> <car. laughs> and we get in the back seat, and he's just hanging out the window the whole time, you know, scoping out all the pretty girls in the in the you know on the road who are watching the parade. Yeah. And he's leaning out the window like, "Howdy, howdy, I'm coming, I'm coming, Beanie Boy." <laughs> was he like seventy at that point? Yeah, he was seventy. Jesus. Wow. That's so incredible. we get to the end of the parade, right? It was like crazy. Then we get out, shake hands with the boxer and everything. Thanks. And quick, John, take off that sign. <laughs> he tear the sign off. He says, give it to me. He rolls up. He wants to save it for later. He saved everything, right? He was like a pack rat. Everything was a souvenir to Bob. So after the parade is over, we go back to the Aqua Velva. We get another dose of it. And we're standing around at the cars. And he says, John, come here. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Oh, what is it, Bob? And he leans over again and he goes, I was never invited to <laughs> So Bob was like Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck rolled up in, into one character. Wow. Hilarious. So his personality 
really was. Oh, yeah, Looney Tunes is Bob Clampett's personality more than anybody else's. I mean, everybody else is kind of a variation of that. But the looniest guy there was Bob Clampett. I mean, it's his real personality was like that. It was interesting to see the evolution of Bugs Bunny go from, like, he's just a fucking lunatic to, no, now he's really smart and calculating and sarcastic and, you know, going up through the going up through the Chuck Jones years. I never really I never really cared much for the Bob McKimpson Bugs Bunny years as much. I don't know why. I just didn't find him as funny. I think all the directors had their their period. You know, uh, well, that didn't sound right, did it? Everyone, yeah. <laughs> so none of them were pregnant. Man, I'm sure they, had kind of, they had a few. Yeah. Uh, and Bob McKimson, I think his first few years were great. Uh, he, he more than any of the other directions, kind of carried on the loony uh, uh, feeling that Tex Avery and Bob Clampett. Yeah. You know, those were the two, really, that formed the Looney Tunes style. And uh, everyone else was kind of a reluctant variation on that, including McKimson. McKimson was really a straight-laced guy in real life. He was a genius animator right he could draw better than anybody in the studio and i i think he drew better than anybody in the whole industry he's just oh, wow. an unbelievable animator right but um when uh when bob well, i think uh, they they wanted to add another unit to looney tunes they had bob mckimson they had no wait they had bob clampett they had chuck jones and frizz freeling frank tashlin i think when frank tashlin was leaving so they needed to replace him with somebody you know i may have some of these facts wrong but around 1944 they decided they needed a new director and uh so chuck and frizz went to leon schlesinger frizz told me the story and went to schlesinger and said hey you know uh, oh schlesinger was thinking of making one of the wacky animators into a director uh, i think he was talking about one of frizz's animators jerry chinicky okay I recognize all of these names from from credit cards, by the way. But Chuck and Frizz didn't want... I'm telling you, this is what Frizz told me. I have it on tape. Frizz told me this. He said, but we didn't want a guy who was going to compete with us. You know, oh. Me and Chuck wanted to be the top dogs at the studio. And uh, so we suggested Bob McKimson because Bob McKimson is a great animator, but he doesn't have any personality, so he's not going to have cartoons that compete with ours. Oh, wow. So they suggested McKimson... And for a few years, I think McKimson's cartoons were a lot funnier than, than Frizz's or... Uh, I mean, he came up with Foghorn Leghorn, and those first few Foghorn yeah. Leghorns are hilarious. The Foghorn Leghorns are hilarious, but I just, like, Chuck Jones's the fucking... The Three Bears... Oh, those are great. ...just fucking destroys me. The Father's Day episode, I mean, so gorgeous. So, I mean, I, animation to me, I think, is the is the perfect art form. It's It's just like the synthesis of... You you know you have brilliant especially with like like Philip Degar you have these amazing background paintings you have amazing character drawings there's comic timing and then there's brilliant music and you have to pull all of those and there's acting and you have to pull all of those things together to make it work and I feel like there's so many different elements that have to click for a cartoon to work that I, I think it's I think it's the most brilliant yeah, form of so many things that can go wrong in the process so so many things which I think why is why it's your approach is smarter because the less people you... T I think it's sort of the way Vince Vincent described to me the way that you uh, told him to draw or told people to draw, which is rather than trying to articulate all of your finger muscles, to it's holding the pencil and then using your arm singularly because there are less muscles to coordinate. Is that true? Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I don't ever remember that, but... That's, uh, I'll try it. Maybe it was attributed <laughs> to you. It was attributed to you. Of just, of just using, just using one, one muscle to draw lines and circles and, you know, basic shapes rather than trying to, you know, like choking well, I down. Don't, I don't start with the details. Maybe you meant that. It's like you try to get the broad strokes first. My whole life has been a lie. Yeah, Chris, what are you going to do? I don't know. Just wrap it up. All right, here's another <laughs> thing that maybe was attributed to you that maybe you didn't say. Is it true that you draw on the phone because it frees up half your brain? Uh, well, Ren and Stimpy started as phone doodles. So I don't do it anymore because they make phones that don't work anymore. <laughs> so I don't do phone doodles anymore. Now I do bacon doodles, which is sort of the same thing. It's like uh, while I'm eating breakfast and dripping grease all over everything, yeah. and I'm using crappy paper like lined note paper and a ballpoint pen, I, I tend to do that if I want to, if I'm doing a storyboard, 
because I don't want to use good paper. I don't want to use good pencils that I worry about. I'm wasting lead or anything like that because I want to draw as fast as I can. And I want to get the spontaneity of the story down. So if I'm not thinking too hard about it, if I'm only using one side of my brain while I'm concentrating on something else, somehow that works better for me. And I'm not saying that works better for everybody. It just happens to work for me because once I get into a more disciplined part of the uh, process, like doing a layout, takes a lot of math yep. and a lot of calculating and uh, and planning and stuff to get a layout to work. Uh, so you want the storyboards to be looser. And, and, when you, and when you draw in this looser way, you get a lot of lucky accidents in your poses, things that you wouldn't think of while you're in discipline mode. Okay. Somehow your hand gets a personality. Like there's different ways to draw for different different jobs, different purposes. And I, and I try to use each different approach that suits whatever the job is that you're doing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you want to be loose. I want to be loose when I'm writing the story. So I, I get my best, most active um, expressions and things when I'm doing these really scribbly, loose uh, storyboard drawings and I have a mouthful of bacon. Well, you, And it used to be on the phone I would do it. Go ahead, you. Uh, um, when uh, when you're writing uh, a cartoon, do you uh, start with the storyboards? You write while you're doing the storyboards, or do you script out um, like an an actual like you know final draft script? Or do you? Uh, I mean, like, what's the process of like telling the story? I do it the old way, the way they did it for the first forty years of animation, and uh, I would just write down some notes of what the story's about. And I'd get together with Vincent and Jim and Bob and whatever. And we'd come up with a story idea, and then we'd just sort of bounce it around the room, gag it up. We'd all be doing sketches as we're doing it. And uh, once we think we got enough ideas to build it into a cartoon, we, we just type them up into an outline. Yeah. And we work out the beginning, middle, and end, so the structure's there. Once I have that, then I go straight to storyboarding, or I give it to a storyboard artist. And then the storyboard artist fills in all the details. But you don't want to tie them down to every detail up front. For one thing, like when you write... When you're just typing or writing, you don't think visually. Even if you're an artist, you you might think that you're thinking visually, and you'll write something out in detail. And then when you start drawing it, you realize it doesn't work, and your hand gets mad at you. Yeah. Says, fuck you. That's that fucking genius. That like an artist writer's room where you're basically workshopping art ideas. Well, think about it. If you're if you're choreographing a dance, you don't write it out in words. You don't type it up on a computer. I would. I can't dance. Well, I mean, you just. It's pretty obvious, right? You would <laughs> you would move around the room and try some steps out. Yeah. And then yeah. there's probably a way that you can write those down in, in some kind of point form thing that the that the other dancers understand. But if you, and same thing if you're going to write a symphony, you don't you don't describe what the clarinets are going to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then they then high, high then kind of high. Freep, freep, freep. Yeah. No, this just, it's, it's, freep, freep, freep. What's really it's cool a is musical it? language. Well, it's and, like uh, and, those old uh, Looney Tunes things where, like, you see the footage of the guys going out into the courtyard and acting out the stuff they were going to try and pull off uh, in animation. Like, you know, like one guy walking a weird way or one guy, like, you know, jumping on top of another guy. Well, they still do that. Like, at the, you know, like, if you watch any of the behind the scenes of, like, Pixar or whatever, like, they have these rooms where artists can go in and there are mirrors and they're, like, acting out and fucking around and, and doing all that stuff. But, do you, you know, I, I think for anyone... Uh, who wants to pursue anything, you know, I think they could have said, you could have said 20 years ago, like, yep, I'm an amazing artist and I don't have to get any better. But it seems like your underlying principle is it doesn't matter how long you're doing it. It doesn't matter what you have to work at it every day and you never, ever stop getting better. You always have to do that. Yeah, you got to keep your eyes open too because the world's full of things that you haven't discovered yet and you can use those things. So a lot of animators only study other animators who study each other. <laughs> so it just becomes, you know, a more and more, a smaller and smaller pool of ideas. Yeah. Um, so you should study lots of artists, but not just artists and not just your own field. Uh, but, you know, look at your friends and family. Uh, they are all weird, right? Everybody you <laughs> know has weird quirks and weird facial tics and they have strange gestures and unique gestures that you've never seen a cartoon character do well incorporate them into your cartoons so you got to keep your eyes open and observant and everything you know like sometimes i'll i, I love watching nature shows whenever i see weird animals who move in a weird way or have strange habits i try to corp incorporate some of those into my characters even if it you know like if ren may not be a, 
a marmoset or something, but in my head, a <laughs> scene where he moves like a marmoset because I thought it was funny. Yeah. yeah. So do you just, when you see something, do you ever see some kind of a quirk or a movement and get stumped and go, fuck, I don't know how to draw that? Oh, yeah. Well, that's the other thing. I mean, you can have all the ideas in the world, but if you can't make your hand do it, you're fucked. <laughs> then the idea lives in your head and you have to go around telling everybody, oh, I have this great idea. <laughs> show I me. I can't show it to you. Oh. Yeah. you know, that's, yeah. what, that's what the animation writers do. It's like they think that they're visual, but they have no way of demonstrating it. So they write a million words. You know, you know the saying like a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Yeah. They think a million words. You start with a million words first, and then force an artist to to try and you know, understand what the hell those words mean. And it's a lot easier to just draw the damn picture. <laughs> yeah. you know, but then you have to have skill. You know, if, you, if you're going to do a lot of different stuff and you're not going to rely on formula, well, that means you have to have a lot of control over your hand. You got to be able to make your hand do what you think you see in your head hard to explain but uh you know what were some of those uh shitty 80s cartoons that you were working on well how shitty can they get <laughs> how about happy days in space <laughs> oh my god i think i remember <laughs> how about, <laughs> how about, how about happy that? days in space i think i remember that fonzie that was when they they were like f eh, it was always like it, just coming up with some little weird creature they would throw characters like underwater. There'd be a weird sea creature in space. There was like Gilligan's Island in space, and they did so. Happy Days in Space. Didn't Fonzie have like a little weird alien sidekick? Yeah, they always had to have an ugly sidekick. He had a dog that looked like an alien. Oh. The ugliest dog. Happy in the Days in Space. Hated drawing that shit. Wow. <laughs> so after that, I got graduated to uh, Laverne and Shirley in the army. What? Sure. Now get mm. this: they're in the army, <laughs> but in the seventies and eighties in, in Saturday morning cartoons. You weren't allowed to draw weapons. You couldn't draw guns. Well, what are you writing a cartoon about the army for if you can't draw a goddamn gun? So what they did was they have them in the army. They ride tanks and everything, but there's no gun barrel on the tank. Oh, weird. It's just this big crab that they're riding. <laughs> did, were Lenny and Squiggy involved? You know, I they were in the can't Navy. remember if they were in it or not. <laughs> they were yeah, in the, they were in the they Navy. Some, they had some weird cartoon pig sergeant who didn't have pants or something. <laughs> Unbelievably stupid and horrible. Wow. Then there was that Gary Coleman dead show. Yes, he was an angel. He was dead, yeah. We had to yeah. draw the dead. We knew he was going to be dead long before he actually did kick off. <laughs> Maybe he saw the cartoons and that's what did him that's in. That's what did it, yeah. It was a delayed effect. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. He was an angel and he had to earn his halo or his wings or something by helping people. I, rem I remember that. I was the right age for all of those cartoons. And then you worked with, ba with Ralph Bakshi. Who I just got. I went to WonderCon and bought an original cell from Wizards, which he was oh, there wow. and he and he signed. Oh yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Someone told me there was a story where he was in a meeting one day and he farted and then reached back and <laughs> and grabbed a tissue and just wiped his ass during the meeting and threw it away and just went back to the meeting. Did you ever hear that story? Uh, Why am I full of lore I, that may not be true? Can I stay out of this story. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. then there's your answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, Ralph was a force of nature. Oh, yeah? And it's to him that we owe uh, the creator-driven cartoons. Yeah. Because uh, it all started with Mighty Mouse, the new adventures sure. of Mighty Mouse in 1987, three years before Ren and Stimpy came out. Right, which you worked on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was the director. I was the supervising director, and I put together the whole studio because he didn't have a studio at the time. And the way we built the studio was he sold the show first to CBS and he'd convinced them that he had a studio and that we had all the stories written and everything we didn't have anything <laughs> <laughs> he sold it he sells the show and he comes running back you know to the we were we were staying in this little tiny uh, apartment above a dress store on, on Ventura Boulevard we were just renting the space where we were developing ideas and things like that uh, and they had rejected all of the ideas that we had created for new Saturday morning shows mm -hmm. on the grounds that you can't make a show about a character oh. no one's ever heard of before because the kids won't understand. Ugh. You know, and we try nice to know some things don't change. Yeah. yeah it's kind of <clears throat> where they get these theories. I mean, obviously they created Bugs Bunny at some point. Right. Popeye right. was created at some point. You didn't know who he was before you I forget it. Don't ask me to explain executive thing. Yeah. But anyways, we were up there developing all these shows. They all got rejected and they told Ralph, well, if you had a character that, um, you know, had marquee value, that was one of the, one of the, uh, I don't know, what do they call those words? Buzzwords. Buzzwords. It was one of the buzzwords they would use. Marquee. He goes, what the fuck is marquee value? 
well, you know, Ralph, it's like a character that everybody already knows. You know, and so Ralph starts thinking about it at the meeting. He goes, Marquee value. And then he goes, you want fucking marquee value? I'll give you fucking marquee value. And all the executives are terrified, right? They're like, they think Ralph's going to explode and kill them all, right? His cigarette butt like flies out of his mouth, hits one of them in the head. <laughs> and so they, they look up at him with terror, like, okay, Ralph, what is it? They tell us who the character is. And he got marquee value. And he goes, I'll tell you who I fucking got. I got Mighty Mouse. <laughs> he remembered the first cartoon he ever worked on, which was Mighty Mouse. Holy he worked shit. at Cherry Tunes in the 50s. Oh, my God. That was his first job. So he just spit out Mighty Mouse. And they wanted to get him the hell out of there before he killed him, right? So they said, okay, we'll take it. We'll take Mighty Mouse. So he gets out of the room. He comes back and grabs me. And he, he, had, a, he had a business partner at the time. And he, he told him, uh, Johnny, his name was John, too. Find out who the fuck owns Mighty Mouse because I just sold it. <laughs> <laughs> so Farner digs around, finds out that Viacom or CBS or somebody owns it. it, it kind of they own the same company. Yeah. He gets the rights to do Mighty Mouse. And that weekend, oh yeah, here's what it was. Okay, I was, uh, me and Ralph were actually uh, having a feud or one of our many feuds at the time. So I had quit or he had fired me or something. So I was just at home sleeping in on Saturday morning. And all of a sudden I hear... It's like, what the fuck, you know, wake up with a hangover and everything, crawl over the door, he busts the door down and he grabs me by the collar, says, get the fucking work. I said, Ralph, you fired me. <laughs> You're hired again. I told Mighty Mouse. I need a fucking studio and I need 13 stories quick. Oh my God. So I get on the phone and I call up everybody I know. Bruce Tim. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, Jim Smith. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, then Naylor, who was... It was my girlfriend at the time, and um, who was an excellent art. She draws the most amazing female oh, bodies. Yeah, she's great. Uh, I mean, I just go down a list of famous cartoonists. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ken Boyer, uh, Eddie Fitzgerald, Tom Minton. And then we hired a bunch of kids out of Cal Arts: um, Jim Reardon, Andy mm -hmm. Stanton, Jeff Pigeon, uh, and there was a couple more too. Uh, and we we had a. Like everyone quit their, if they were already working at some studio, which all the, all the professionals were, they all quit. Like everyone, like all the bosses showed up at their respective studios the next day and like they were missing half the crew. Where did everybody go? <laughs> They're all working for Ralph Bakshi. <laughs> what? They left Laverne and Shirley in the army <laughs> to work on some crappy Ralph Bakshi cartoon? <laughs> They're all offended and everything. So we had a studio like in two days of about 35 people. Really good cartoonist too, and uh, and uh, uh, Tom Minton, Jim Reardon, me, Eddie, like just came up with a whole bunch of story ideas over the weekend, and we came up with a presentation, real fast, and we got Libby Simon to to paint it up, and, and Vicky Jensen painted the background. We only had like one drawing to show them that we had a presentation for Mighty Mouse. <laughs> like they thought we had been working on this all summer, right? We worked on it for a weekend. And Vicky Jensen did this beautiful background painting. Uh, Eddie drew a, a drawing of, of uh, I think it was Pearl Pureheart and, mm -hmm. and, and Mighty Mouse and stuff. And Libby Simon put it on a giant uh, cell. Looked great. And, and so a week later, after he had sold the show, Judy Price from CBS shows up to hear what the stories are. And we pitched her like 13 stories. They, they weren't all written yet. Yeah. We just had premises. We came up with like the basic idea for story, and we just every one of us took turns. Like Jim Reardon would get up and pitch a story, Tom Minton would pitch a story, I pitched a story, Eddie pitched a story, and we pitched a whole pile of stories. And we were making shit up as we went along <laughs> and everything. And at the end of the pitch, Judy looks at Ralph and she says, "It's great, Ralph. I love it. It's so different and new." And we're like, "Whoa, we can't <laughs> believe it." So then we were in production the following week. It was Whoa. insane. It was completely insane. And the way we did the production, we just turned the whole studio system upside down. Uh, we completely threw out that whole assembly line system. And I went back to the Looney Tunes unit system. So, uh, you know, let's have directors. Like I was the main director. I was the supervising director. So I kind of oversaw all the creative aspects of the show. Yeah. Um, but then we had, we, we broke the place into three or four units. Like I had a unit. Eddie had a unit. Uh, Steve Gordon had a unit, um, Bruce uh, Woodside had a unit, and each unit had their own storyboard artists, had their own layout artists, had their own, uh, well, the, 
the story department was basically a separate department. We wanted to write all the stories on storyboards, like we did later on Ren and Stimpy, but that was just too radical for for Judy Price and CBS at the time. She didn't get that at all. But she did at least say it was okay for the cartoonist to write the stories. Okay. So that was a huge advance. Wow, yeah. So even though we typed them on scripts, we were still sketching for ourselves the whole time to make sure stuff was going to work. And then we worked directly with the storyboard artists. So we installed this unit system like Looney Tunes had. And, and, we, and we did the layouts all in-house, which was all the key poses, which normally the layouts would be sent to Korea or, or uh, Taipei or something. And then they would come back with no life whatsoever. They would just tra trace the model sheet packages where the characters are just standing there really stiff with no pose, no expression. So all of a sudden, for the first time in 30 years or something, or 40 years, a cartoon comes out where the characters have a different expression and pose for you know every second. They're constantly changing and moving and doing weird things. It was still, the animation was crappy. We sent it to Taipei, and it came back all like, you know, goofy and bad timing and stuff like that. And also, like I was saying earlier, even though there were a lot of talented people on the crew, nobody had any experience doing this. We didn't know it was going to work. We just knew it worked 60 years ago, <laughs> and we're going to try it ourselves. So we had to just, like, wing it. And in the first season of Mighty Mouse, you know, there was a lot of cartoons that kind of didn't make that much sense kind of anarchic because we were just trying everything Every, we were so frustrated from years of working on crap and not being allowed to be creative that all of a sudden it was just like you know floodgates yeah, yeah. just every, every idea we ever had <laughs> came out and whether they fit together or not didn't matter we got to get it out and just do it so some of the cartoons are pretty abstract but there were a handful of them that actually had storylines and had a beginning middle and end uh the littlest tramp written by uh tom minton um, which made fun of all those 30s uh, little match girl type cartoons. Yeah. The sob story. And it was made fun of pathos, which was something that we carried on into Ren and Stimpy, making fun of pathos. Like, I hate it when cartoons use pathos and hit you over the head. <laughs> like, okay, now it's time to cry. It's, oh, I want to fucking cry. Give the cartoon to laugh. If I want to cry, I'll, you know, I don't know, I'll shoot myself. <laughs> I'll cut a finger off if I want to cry. Did you, do you appreciate... Um, because obviously that idea of like, okay, now it's complete anarchy because we can do whatever we want. <clears throat> do you appreciate any of the structure at all to sort of keep keep the anarchy in line? Or do you, how do you kind of... Well, I totally wanted structure myself. I wanted the stories to have a beginning, middle, and end and, and to be character-based. But having 40 people in the, in the crew and doing this for the first time, no one person can, you know, oversee all of that and make it happen. And plus, I didn't have any real practice at doing that this was the first time i got to direct a cartoon from beginning to end you know my whole career but i knew the concept that i knew when something was working and when it wasn't working but we couldn't stop something when it wasn't working we had to get the stuff to, done in like two and a half months to get it on the air sure so it was whatever came out of the story we were, do it <laughs> so some of the stories you know i really cringe watching now but there were a handful of them that that I thought were really successful. There was one called uh, Mighty's Benefit Plan that made fun of Al Alvin and the Chipmunks, <laughs> written by Jim Reardon. And that one totally made sense. It was a great satire, and it was funny in its own right, too. Uh, it was, we did uh, another one uh, <laughs> making fun of Batman. It was like, I think that was the first making fun of Batman cartoon since, you know, who knows, since the 40s or something. That's funny because Bruce Tim would then go on. Yeah. To, yeah, being. Yeah, well, Bruce Tim was like my. He was basically my right-hand man as far as layouts go. Oh, wow. So I did, like, I was drawing as many drawings as I could possibly do because a lot of the artists didn't even know the concept of, yet, even if they were good artists, of doing a lot of uh, acting expressions, posing expressions, where I'd been doing that for years on my own just for fun. And I had some previous experience on the Jetsons where I got to do the layouts and I experimented with making the the expressions actually match the soundtrack which freaked everyone out at Hanna Barbera but I what I learned doing that I applied it to Mighty Mouse right away and I and seeing that not everyone was able to do that right off the bat I just did tons of super rough drawings and then I would hand stacks of these to Bruce I said to turn these into something <laughs> and he would take them and he would make them all work make sure they were on the pegs in the right place and he would uh, finish the the drawings where I hadn't finished them and he'd retain all the expressions and poses and stuff and uh, so he he probably drew half of that uh, uh, my uh, Elwi and the Tree Weasels. Yes, cartoon. that's right. I think I, <laughs> I think I remember 
and I, I do remember this for a fact that you made a you made a statement about how <laughs> in the chipmunks are like, well, it's just so weird that this guy has these rodents and he makes them wear human clothing. Yeah, that's what the cartoon was about. <laughs> it was kind of explaining the origin story of that. But more importantly, you obviously uh, made drawings of all the Jetsons fucking each other, right? I mean, that's what artists do in their free time. Well, I didn't do it on the show. No, no, of course that didn't pass. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I. It's ever, like that famous. When I was a kid, I used to do the Flintstones doing dirty things. I used to do flip books on the sides of my, uh, <laughs> you know, my math textbooks and history textbooks. I take the great big textbooks, and I would just fill the sides of them, the edges of the paper, with flip books and, and stuff. And they were all like dirty Flintstones and everything. <laughs> that just ended up in the school system somewhere. Like what the? Oh yeah, they get, became collector's items afterwards. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So was. Uh... So then, when you leave that, and you start working on Ren and Simpy, and you have you know Nickelodeon is kind of the counterweight to what you're doing was it did you was it okay right away or did it not work out right away i mean obviously i know stuff went down with the show but what did it what did it feel like at the time well whenever it was just me and the one executive the main executive in an office everything went great whenever it was vanessa coffee and me everything went great you know uh we would basically trade each other stuff that we wanted in the show you know, I wanted to do the booger jokes and the fart jokes. I said, you know, I'd explain, hey, this is for kids. I want to give the kids what they want. Nobody else is doing it. If we just give kids what they want, we will get killer ratings because no one else will do it. Every other cartoon is giving them morals. Even He-Man is giving you, like, stupid yeah. morals at the end of not, the Not just booger jokes, though, but you did that... You did that thing, which I wasn't used to seeing in cartoons, which is you would do these beautiful, like, key paintings when you yeah. would zoom in on something, and it was just the detail was so... So disgusting. <laughs> it, no, but it was... But it was... I'd never seen that before. Yeah, it was great. Of just, that came from Matt. That came from uh, Basil Wolverton. Basil Wolverton is a phenomenal cartoonist from the 40s and 50s and, and 60s. And he used to do those like, really ugly faces. Yeah. They're super detailed. They had the rotting teeth and the yeah. veins all over the eyeballs. But he did it in a way that even though it's supposed to be ugly, it was really cute and appealing. And uh, so we were doing that. We were trying to do that, only we did it in color. And just for certain gags, we would you know show the close-up painting. Uh, later, when Nickelodeon started to do the uh, show, some of the some of those drawings actually became ugly and sort of terrifying rather than funny. Yeah. And I, you know, and then that sort of migrated to other people's cartoons. And now everybody does it still. Not everybody, but some shows still have that gag, the gross close-up paintings. But they're kind of they missed the point. It's not meant just to be gross. It's it's gross and funny. Yeah. yeah. And you have to be you have to have some appeal to it to be funny. A little bit, an edge of cuteness. It's hard to explain, but you, you can draw something ugly that really is ugly that turns you off, or you can draw something ugly that you laugh at. Yeah. And that's that's what I was trying to do. I'm sure you've been. I'm sure you've talked about this a million times, but I'm just I'm just curious from your from your point of view of when your show gets taken away from you. Is it a relief or are you just fucking mad? Like, what is, is it? Was it was both. It was a relief because for the last couple of months of the second season, they were playing all kinds of tricks on us and undermining everything. I mean, you were refusing to put your name on stuff because it was changing so much, right? You weren't even getting, like, well, Nurse no, there was only one cartoon. Nurse Stimpy. The only reason I wanted to take my name off that, you got to understand, when the first couple of cartoons came back from, from Taipei or from Korea, wherever, they, wherever we sent them to Asia, they looked horrible. When you watched, uh, like, Stimpy's Big Day yeah, and the Big Shot, that was the, the, the very first cartoon we did was Big House Blues. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we did that, we animated half of it at Spumco and half of it at Carbuncle in Canada. So it was all really good animation, a very beautiful animation. We did all the backgrounds and everything. We didn't ship any of that overseas. But once we were on the series, you know, the budget restrictions are like, you've got to send some stuff overseas, which I hated. So we did all the layouts on Stimpy's Big Day and, and the Big Shot, which was the first half hour. And you look at the layouts, they were pretty funny. Um, and we ship it overseas. And the condition it came back was hideous. So we're looking at the rough cut of the animation on the Moviola. And it was just, a, you know, the, the key crew was there looking at the Moviola. Yeah. Vanessa was there looking at the Moviola. And I thought... This looks so horrible. We're going to get fired. The first episode, I don't know if you noticed, but Ren, Ren has black eyelids all through the cartoon. 
because the Koreans didn't know what the hell Ren was. <laughs> they couldn't figure out whether it was up or down or sideways. So they were just guessing, like, what are those giant things coming out of his head? <laughs> and I think they thought the eyelids were his eyebrows or something. The, we were just had a weird American style of drawing. Oh, shit. So they colored his eyelids in black. And when you saw this, with no music, no sound effects, and it hadn't been edited you know, to tighten up the timing or anything, it just looked like a mess. And the cells were dirty and scratched up and paint was falling off them and the lines were all broken up. And the way they cleaned up the characters looked horrible. And there were a million shooting mistakes. You know the scene in, you know, the, sh the short bumper with Stimpy's Breakfast Tip? Yeah, yeah. Where he explains to you how to, how to get the prize out of the cereal yep. without your dad you know, catching you? They totally screwed that up. They, you know, you would do the timing. Bob Jakes did the timing on that, and he's great at timing. He's a great director, right? So he did this wonderful timing on, on Snippy's Breakfast Tips. You send it overseas, and the cameraman would never read your X sheets. That's what we write the timing on. Right? Oh, shit. They'd just throw it out, and they'd make it up on the spot. They would just stack the cells up and kind of put them in whatever oh, order they no. want. Oh, no. Yeah. No. So Snippy's Breakfast Tips, it's really obvious if you look at it close. You can see that. Snippy keeps doing, like, he'll do an expression and a little action with his hands or something, and then he repeats it three times. And you're like, what the hell is going on? And it doesn't match the soundtrack. Can you send it back at that point, or you're like, fuck, we're stuck with it now? Well, we couldn't, we made a retake list, and it was like 500 retakes, 500 mistakes or something like that. And there's no way. Even if, even if they could afford to make the retakes, it would take so long, they would never make the air date. Oh, no. So we had to just... Uh, make a few retakes but anyways we're watching Stimpy's breakfast tips and there's this scene near the end where he holds up the box of cereal the box of cereal in the bowl and he looks at the camera and I forget what he says but all of a sudden his eyes disappear and he just has these giant black spots in the middle of his face <laughs> and when that came on the movie Ola, when that scene came on for the first time Everyone just went, ah! <laughs> what? <laughs> and we had somebody, we had somebody there who was writing down all the retakes, right? And that person was like, Ugh. she started to write the retake out, and then I shoved my hand in her face. I said, wait, 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 no, no, no. I like it. <laughs> keep that, that one. Keep. Fix all the other stuff. Leave those fucking eyes on there, because that is the, <laughs> we could never come up with anything that weird. <laughs> and it's there, you know? It's like it's just the freakiest looking thing ever. And I, to this day, I don't know how they made the mistake. You know, like, you can't figure out, like, how that happened. It's just the weirdest thing ever. That's amazing. So you said you felt relief after, after it happened. Well, that was two years later, and they'd been, they'd been, like, sneaking behind our backs and undermining us and doing all kinds of horrible things. And they hadn't paid us for, like, a month. So we saw our bank account going down, dwindling and dwindling and dwindling. And, not, you know, I'm trying to make the cartoons, and I'm worried about in, in a couple of weeks I can't pay the crew. I'll have to lay them off or something. And we kept begging for Nickelodeon to give us the money they owed us, right? And they just they kept saying, oh, yeah, it's coming, it's coming. Don't worry about it. And they never meant to send it at all. They wanted me to run out of money so they could just show up with a big truck, take all the artwork, and start their own studio. Mm -hmm. So when that finally did happen, yeah, part of me was like, hate Gil <laughs> and the same with the rest of Spumco right everybody was furious except for the you know handful of assholes that helped Nickelodeon do it They're, that you know went behind their backs and were talking to Nickelodeon for a month before oh, it happened Jesus so yeah the rest of us were furious but at the same time after all that stress yeah I was kind of relieved although then we had to go into like giant you know contract and negotiations to end the thing and everything and that was a nightmare and then they kept calling me up and trying to bribe me to help them start their studio and stuff and, you know it was just a disgusting i'll cut this out, i'll cut this out if you want me to but this is one of the funniest things i've ever seen was i had a friend who i knew through the ucla animation department who had gotten a job i think helping with some of the timing sheets on the new production of the show and i went to have lunch with them someday and you had you had drawn a picture you had drawn a picture of Bob Camp with a shackle around his neck and his finger up a Ren doll's ass, <laughs> and you taped the two ends of it together in a fax machine and just sent it on a loop <laughs> so it would fax over and over and over. And so they had this long, <laughs> serious, <laughs> this drawing, which was... And did it have all his quotes from, the, from him doing interviews? <laughs> it didn't have any... Oh, I don't know. Maybe it did, but it yeah. was just, just like you just see this spitting out the fax machine like... That's a pretty genius way to. Well, there park. was a there was a photo of him in the L.A. Weekly or something, 
trying to paint a rosy picture on the whole situation, right? And it was a picture of him holding up the Ren doll as so you, if he was the creator of Ren and Stimpy. Yeah. So, you know, we looked at that. It's like, well, we can't believe what's happening. It's one thing to, like, you know, screw all your friends and everything. But then to go around, like, acting like you created the whole thing, it's like, amazing. Ugh. Did you guys ever make up, or was that? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, but then George Licker, which I think, from what I understand, was kind of the main thing that you were initially pitching, right? Well, George Licker was part of Ren and Snippy. He was one of the main characters. I know he turned up, I know he turned up a lot in the Ren and Snippy cartoon. No, he actually only appeared, well, he had, there were two shows, two episodes where he was one, one of the main characters. Yeah. And then he had a cameo in one or two. Like he was in, he was a sheriff of Nottingham, I think, mm-hmm. for just one scene or two scenes in the, in the uh, Robin Hawk episode. And then there was one episode where, keep out of my trash! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's that one. But they hated him. The Nickelodeon people hated George Licker. Even though he was part of the... You know, to me, he was like integral to the show. He was the, one of the main characters. Yeah. He was always part of it. He was their master. So, uh, anyways. When, uh, when they finally split with me, I said, well, look, since you hate George Licker anyways, why don't you just give him back to me? Because you don't want him anyways. And they were freaking out. It's like, no, we don't want to give him back. Well, why? You're not going to use him. Go, oh no! But uh, you'll have him, you know. You'll do cartoons about him being a mass murderer or something, and that will reflect on Ren and Stimpy. I'm like, what, how do you get Republican to mass murderer? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a big gap between the two. <laughs> he's just like a dad. He's not. He's based they off thought he dad. was evil. They thought he was like a completely evil monster. I'm like, no, he's just like a regular middle American. Oh, is that right? Is he, based, is he based, based on your on dad? dad? Well, partly. He's, yeah. A lot of my dad stories get, are in George Licker. A lot of his personality traits are is that, part of George Licker. I, it, it seems, and maybe this, maybe I'm off base here, but it seems like you do have this kind of gravitation toward that classic sort of 50s idealized guy, like the guy's guy, like whether it's Kirk Douglas or George Licker, you know, or is that was that just sort of part of part of your youth? Well, I always admired manly guys, even though I wasn't one. <laughs> I wished I was. I mean, I guess that's why I read so many superhero comics and everything, you know, like a, a lot of nerdy kids. They all want to be, uh, you know, Mr. Fantastic or The sure. Thing or something. I wanted to be The Thing. It's like, <laughs> or, you know, I would gravitate between The Thing and, uh, and uh, Peter Parker. You know, right. I wanted to beat the shit out of Flash. I wouldn't take that crap from Flash. Right? <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I was just a skinny kid who didn't even play sports or anything. I'd sit in my room and draw pictures. But, of course, I, you know, if I did have muscles and I was tough, I would surely have been a bully. <laughs> I mean, what boy wouldn't be if they could do it, right? Yeah. If you could get away with beating everyone else up, you would. So I was admired and was fascinated by real manly guys, you know, and especially uh, authority figures, people that hate me. I'm really fascinated by people who make rules. That's why I love Ranger Smith and Yogi Bear. Right. Love Ranger Smith. I think it's hilarious that this guy goes around, you know, posting up all these rules against the forest creatures who were there for millions of yeah. years before, <laughs> before man ever discovered it. All of a sudden, you got to follow man's fucking rules. A 16 year old kid, and he hates him. It's the stupidest upside down backwards system ever. So, what's so the So, somehow we have to get back to somebody's got to make something that actually has some skill as well as entertainment. And, and we have to bring back the idea of high standards. Like, you know, when you watch old entertainers, like, you really had to be able to sing in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, right? You couldn't use a voice box or whatever the hell that thing is, the auto-tune yeah, thing. Yeah, No, you had to be able to carry a tune. Not only that, you had to have a great voice. Right. You know, they don't have great voices anymore now. They have the auto-tune, and everybody has sounds the same. Or they have that weird uh, the rap, which is not even singing, you know. Or they have uh, that weird meandering sort of the American Idol style Oh, right. thing that uh, they yeah. call singing that has no tune. It's uh, soul yodeling is soul what we call yeah. is what we call that where they, they go just warble uh, around. Yeah, yeah, but there's no melody. It's like what what is this? It sounds like vocal exercises. Or something. Yeah, <laughs> pick a note and stick with like it. Like the the main thing about music, they don't do it anymore, and that's having a nice melody that you know you can remember and everybody wants to sing along. That's completely gone. Goddamn kids and their rap hooks. music. Just like cartoons, you know, aren't really visual anymore. 
I find that uh, the the cartoon Adventure Time has uh, they have a lot of uh, storyboard uh, writers on that show that. If you're not kind of hearing a joke, you're seeing something uh, funny visually. And that's why I kind of was wondering if yeah, you Yeah, there's two or three of them. I think Phineas and Ferb is still written. Phineas and Ferb. Those guys, and those are older guys that kind of went through the trenches before getting their own cartoon. Uh, Marsh and uh, Swampy Marsh, is that his name? This is the perfect time for you to st- start making stuff again. You have your Kickstarter now. And you're online. You have a Twitter account. I'm, I'm goddamn tweeting now. You fuck it. What, what's, I'm what's not your... very good at it though. It's like no I, one's I good at it. Out Nobody's good it. at it. It's Twitter. No one's good I at can't it. Can't figure out what it's for. Taco Bell's pretty good at it. <laughs> it's like, why does anybody want to read one sentence from anybody? Yeah. Well, I just took a dump. Oh, oh great! Wow. I'll tell you what's great about Kim Twitter. Kim Kardashian took a dump. That <laughs> giant ass. It must have been beautiful. I... <laughs> <laughs> it was just like when Stippy gave birth to a uh, baby, the big baby turd. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, the idea though is, I think it goes back to the earlier idea that you were talking about drawing, which is that Twitter forces you to use as few words as possible to express an idea. So it actually can help you learn to economize in the same way that you know just yeah, drawing. But there's simple a certain lines. point where economy is too. <laughs> it's like too economical. Yeah. So you can't get anything. You can't have a beginning, middle, and end in a tweet. That's for sure. What's your? You can't have structure in a tweet. What's your Twitter account? Uh, John Chris Felucci one. John Chris Felucci one. Did someone really take John Chris Felucci? Yeah. That's a shame. Mm-hmm. Maybe somebody there's another took one. George Liquor too. What? Oh, Jesus Christ! Yeah, I had to make up Liquor George or something. Ugh. Is the the guy who squatted John Chris Felucci? Is he is he a fan of yours or just wanted to? I think he is because he didn't say anything bad or anything on it. And I don't think he uses it anymore. He did it for a while. You probably get that back. Well, they make you go through hell, though. They, nah. like, they want me to prove who I am. I know how to. I know how to. I can like, well, doesn't the other guy have to prove that he's me? That, I just can, fax them a drawing of it's Bob obvious Camp. It's me. I can. I can help you. I will help you. Oh yeah. If it's possible to get it back, I, I can. I can get it back. You got pull in the in the tweet universe. I got some pull here. And there. <laughs> Uh, I don't do much in this life, but I got some pull here and there. Cool. Uh, but you have the the Kickstarter campaign seems to be going pretty good. Uh, there's a lot of yeah. Do- that's uh, something I really have hopes for. Not just this particular project, but the fact that you completely you know, direct have direct access with the fans, with the audience. So you can pitch them an idea. If they don't like the idea, well, you can react to it. Kind of like um, if a comedian gets up on stage, workshopping. You know, you got you get this immediate input from the people you're trying to entertain. Mm-hmm. And that's how you become a better entertainer is is deal directly with them. Don't have a thousand middlemen in between you and the audience, which is the system in the corporations. Yeah, no, we're both com- we're both comics. It would be really bad if we had to perform for for an executive a, for, for executives first and then they let the crowd in after we imagine? got their notes. That'd be insane. <laughs> or, or if the executives tried to explain the jokes to the audience. <laughs> like, hey, we'll, focus, make, we'll make it a little focus better. Testing. If yeah. they focus tested your jokes. Such a waste of time. And had some librarian read the jokes to somebody deadpan with no delivery and no timing or right. anything. It's like, but that's what they do. That's how they make movies. That's how they make television. That's how they make toys. It's it's like completely inefficient, insane. Sterile. Wastes ton of, tons of money. And there are very f- few successes that come out of that system compared to how much waste there is. Well, particularly insane. when you're when you're focus grouping something, though, you're telling you're telling a random sampling of people... We want you to be critical of this. And so they want to feel empowered and smart. And so I feel like, I feel like most focus grouping is like just people just making up shit to, yeah. you know. It's not natural. Like, well, they're paying me to say something shitty about this thing, so I'm just going to tell them something. I don't like yeah. those shoes. It's yeah. completely artificial, yeah. What is the, what, what's the show? Tell us about the show for Kickstarter. Well, it stars George Licker. Yes. American. <laughs> the last true... You know, all American. Um, and uh, he's very frugal. He grew up, you know, in tough times. Like, you kids today have got it easy. You don't know what it was like when I was a kid. And you got to learn to save a buck around here. George loves, he doesn't want to waste anything, right? So he's always looking for a bargain, just like my dad always was. So when he goes to the supermarket, he looks for the stuff that's marked down. And there's one section of the supermarket that has one shelf with all these damaged cans. And uh, that have lost their labels. So even the people in the store don't know what's in the can. So they figure, well, we'll just mark it down to five cents or 10 cents and then somebody will buy it, you know, on the, on the chances that there's something good in the can. So George Licker 
buys all these cans, right? And he brings them home. And he loves this. He loves the mystery in the can. And he loves how much money he's going to save, too. <laughs> right? So uh, he builds some shelves in the basement where he stores all these cans. Because you never know. There might, you know, the commies might in Canada might drop the bomb <laughs> and blow the shit out of everything. But we're going to be prepared. We got our cans. We got our bomb shelter. He's prepared for every hazard possible. And he wants to train the kids, you know, to think like this too. You know, you got to be responsible. You, know, you can't be a kid all your life. You know, you can't read your little comic books and play your video games all day long. It's time you started putting away money for your future. <laughs> the money I save on these cans, you know, I could put that towards bailing you out of reform school one day. <laughs> on the verge of a heart attack. <laughs> right. He's always on the verge of a heart yeah, attack. Just, yeah, it's always about to. Yeah. Oh, he only eats meat, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's only one vegetable he likes, you know. Vegetables are for girls and wimps. Except he likes onions. Onions a man's vegetable. Cuz it hurts. If it hurts, it's all right with me. He fights back the tears and he eats a whole onions by himself. Yeah. Can't cry cuz you can't cry. No, you can't cry. No. Although one thing does make him cry. And that's country music. <laughs> and uh, he he doesn't like to admit that he likes music cuz he thinks it's kind of sissy to like music and stuff. Yeah. But when when nobody's around, <laughs> he shuts all the all the windows and you know turns the blinds down and, it's on the road. and yeah he goes to his closet. He's got an old Victrola over there <laughs> and he pulls out all these old seventy eights of cowboy songs and he loves the Sons of the Pioneers because they have so many songs about trees, <laughs> like haunting beautiful songs with harmony men singing about trees the tears just <laughs> flow from George they just pour down him. Yeah. he's crying all over his chainsaws while he's listening to the signs of the pioneers and Frankie Lane and... cleaning chainsaws oh yeah but then he gets mad at himself like after he has his little tear fest he gets really mad at himself he feels guilty about yeah. it and he breaks all the records and... <laughs> but then he finds him again in another launch sale and... yeah do you feel like it's important for you? Because <laughs> you never really... Did you ever... Did you set out to do voices of the characters? Or was it just like, fuck it, I know what these characters are, so I might as well just do them. Like, No, I you know, I don't like my own voice. You know when you listen to your voice on the... Well, you're a comedian, so you're probably used to it. But a, a lot of people, when they hear their voice on their answering machine, they're like, who's that? Who did that message on my answering machine? <laughs> Why do I still uh, have an answering machine? You did. <laughs> no, I didn't. That's not me. It's like, fuck. That's, I can't watch these videos either that I'm in. You know, like I pitched the cartoon. Really? Yeah, because, whoa, do I make those faces? Do I make those gestures? <laughs> oh, this is disgusting. Especially Great. you because you're, hy you're hyper aware of that stuff because of what your job is. You're so hyper aware of just little ticks and idiosyncrasies. You probably see ten times the things that Well, you know, everybody see. thinks of themselves as a, they're like a newscaster, right? That they speak like a newscaster. Oh, I speak, I articulate all my, my uh, words perfectly and my grammar is great. And then you watch a video yourself, and you're saying like and wow and all yeah. this shit. Like, uh, yeah. Every other word. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Remember when Barack Obama was first doing his campaigns? Uh, and he used to do those long, oh. Yeah. Someone must have told him or he must have watched video of himself because he stopped doing it after a while. Well, that's why as a comedian, it's so important. You tell people, like, you have to record yourself and you have to listen to it because the only way you're going to pick that stuff up is if you can listen to it or watch it as an audience member and then go. Or if you tr if you write out your set. Like, when I when I was a young comic, I would record and then write out my sets and be like, I said, uh, 50 times yeah. in the span of t five minutes. Like is the hard one to get it past oh. in conversation. Like, 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 yeah. like, 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 or you like, know. Like, in, like, oh, like, like, yeah. you know, I didn't uh, even like, know, you know I said this stuff. I just, you yeah. know, I would make fun of other people for, you know, valley girls and stuff, and they're yeah. talking like that. And then you hear yourself, it's filler. Somehow you absorb this crap, and you're a valley girl, too. Yeah. Holy shit. Did you, when you, so you didn't, it wasn't your choice to do the Ren voice, or you just. No, no, no. Um, uh, I just wanted somebody to do Peter Lorre. Yeah. So I tried every voice actor I knew, oh, the, uh, about 20 of them. And uh, everybody came in. And, you know, they're good voice actors and everything. But nobody could give him... They could, they could all imitate Peter Lorre. That's, I think that's the first thing every voice actor learns is to <laughs> make fun of Peter Lorre because it's such a great voice. Right? But none of them could capture the intensity and the insanity that I wanted Ren to have. So I tried everybody, even Billy. And, uh, and Billy's like the best voice actor in the business, right? He did a great Stimpy, and all his other characters were great. But when he did Ren, I was like, it's not really... It's just not as intense as I want it. So somebody suggested to me, I think it might have been Vincent or someone, just go in and record it yourself and send it to Nickelodeon and see what they say. 
So I went in and recorded it. I hated it, right? I did a bunch of the lines. I hated it. But everyone was laughing in the, in the booth and stuff. So we sent it off to Nickelodeon, and they, they chose it. I don't think they knew it was me. They said, get that guy, number five, you know, that guy. <laughs> wow. so, so then I was stuck doing the voice. And, you know, the funny thing is what you were just saying, how you have to practice your voice and your delivery sure, and everything sure. and listen to yourself. I make all my actors do that, especially when they're new actors. Uh, like people are always coming up to me saying, I want to be a, a voice actor, you know, and then they start imitating all the other voice actors and it's usually terrible. But now and then somebody really good will come along who's a good mimic, like Eric Bowser. Eric oh, yeah, Bowser. he does uh, Snippy now. Yeah, and yeah, Eric, he's great. Eric was an intern first at Spumco and I didn't even notice him for about a year. I just, some guy used to walk around and call me sir all the time. Hello, <laughs> sir. And shake my hand. Wearing his baseball really cap. Firm grip. And I, I just didn't notice him because I was running around doing whatever I'm doing, right? And who is this guy calling me sir all the time? So then everyone's telling me, hey, you know that guy, that intern, Eric, he's, uh, he, he does really funny voices. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I hear that from everybody, right? Everybody yeah. wants the easy job. They all want to be the cartoon writer and they want to be the cartoon voice because those are the two easiest jobs. Right. In their minds. So then, uh, the following year after uh, doing, I think uh, he was working on Weekend Pussy Hunt, and I went up to Canada to work on The Ripping Friends. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Eric came with me, and then we were you know, much closer. We were together all the time, and he would do all these voices for me, and I was still like, yeah, yeah, that's great. You know, here goes Xerox this crap, will you? <laughs> <laughs> and he was good at, at, at mimicking, you know, he could mimic Daffy Duck or Bugs Bunny or, you know, Jack Benny or you name it. The, you can do all the Simpsons. You know, when I was reading a couple of years ago how the all the Simpsons voices uh, were going on strike or whatever and they yeah. demanded more money and everything, I was think, telling Eric, Eric, go down there, tell him you'll do it for <laughs> half the price. He can do every voice on the Simpsons. You could not tell him from the, the real actors, you know. You did a cartoon with uh, Eric Bauza, the McBusters, the Mike Chillian. Oh, yeah, the uh, Mike Chillian one. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we were doing the, then we uh, were starting the uh, new Ren and Stimpy's for Spike. And I called Billy to see if he would do uh, Stimpy. And he didn't want to do it. Or he wanted to do it for too much money or whatever. Didn't work out. So I'm like stuck. Oh my God, who am I going to get to do Stimpy? Because right. uh, he made that voice iconic. Uh, so I tried a few other guys and people sort of could imitate it, but they might not, didn't have the right pitch mm -hmm. whatever there was a guy that's a very good voice actor in town and he pretty much got the personality and everything but his voice was too deep and when we tried to speed it up it just didn't sound right so eric said let me try let me try let me try i said okay eric look i'm gonna give you a shot i'm desperate but don't imitate billy imitate what billy's imitating larry fine. imitate larry fine so i gave him a whole bunch of my three stooges tapes and i said here's what i want you to do don't come back and do it for me do it on a tape first and listen to it and self-criticize -crit yourself. So this is what I tell all the young actors. The only person I don't tell this to is me because I can't stand the sound <laughs> of my voice. I never listen to my recordings if I can help it. Do as I say. I can't stay it. I can't stand it. But anyways, so he did it. He went, he got very disciplined and he went back and he listened to all the Larry Fine things he did. I said, first, do Larry Fine's famous lines. You know, do a whole bunch of his lines. Play them back. Listen to them. Criti criticize yourself. And then... Um, after you get that down, then take this bunch of lines from Stimpy. And I acted out the scenes for him. Then come back and do it for me. And he spent like three or four days or something doing all this. He was very disciplined about it. He came back and he did a great job. It's like, now you're not just being a mimic. Now you're into the personality. And you went back to the, to the roots of it instead of imitating an imitation. And then you get to blow your voice out doing Ren. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's getting harder and harder because my voice gets more and more destroyed over the years and i just did that podcast before this right oh yeah you did the stick so camp thing. super horse did now. they make you do the ren voice there no but if i talk for an hour and a half i just blow my voice out <laughs> well then we should let you go because we have been here an hour and a half but uh this was a tremendous honor for me i've been such a huge fan since ever and uh and i would love to have you back on and would love to help you with the kickstarter um, what should people, where should people go? I just look up George Licker on Kickstarter or look up John Chris Lucy on Kickstarter. Well, the, the cartoon is called Cans Without Labels. <laughs> uh, it's usually on the Kickstarter. It's on the front page of the popular page or the animation page. Yeah. But it's pretty easy to search it. You just search. I mean, you can...
tweet me. Yep. You can go to my Facebook page, uh, which I'm trying to remember what the hell my name is on Facebook. You tell you, I can't remember. John Chris Falusi, forty two. <laughs> you probably something like that. I'm sure they could just. I don't even remember. They can search it. And the weird thing is because I, you know, put up this Kickstarter project a couple of weeks ago, and I had to start a Twitter account. Now my Facebook page is just swamped. I can't even read it anymore because there's so many retweets and and like millions of people there now. And I'm like, ah, I don't know what I'm looking at anymore. So I, I don't even know who to answer. What the you you are. almost hit Ren. You almost hit him just now when you got intense. <laughs> you almost hit him. You fat, bloated idiot. <laughs> That's what I wanted. <laughs> Oh, what I'm going to do to you. <laughs> First, I'm going to gouge your eyes out. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And then, I'm going to tear your arms out of the sockets. And then I'm going to hit you. <laughs> and you're going to fall. And I'm going to look down, and I'm going to laugh. <laughs> You're scaring us, Ren. Don't do it. No tearing the arms out. Uh, All right, thanks a lot, Chris. It's the greatest day of my life. It's the greatest fucking day of my life. Enjoy your burrito, everyone. God damn it, that's fucking amazing. Now leaving Nerdist.com. <laughs> This episode of the Nerdist Podcast is brought to you by Comedy Bang Bang, every Friday at 10, 9 central on IFC.